So we're just going to, we're going to, I'm going to open it up to questions uh, in a moment. Uh, I have one question for each of them uh, to end off with. This is the, the Lipton, the end of the Lipton portion. Um, and basically it was, if you could put on your Harry Potter sorting, sorting out the Canadian television industry hat, if you could change one or two things that would make it easier for you to do your job, what would those the two things be? <laughs> um, John's is point to Dagan. Let her answer first. <laughs> well, it's really just one thing, and this is such a crappy thing to say, but just a bit more money mm -hmm. um, so that we could have uh, more writers and um, uh, because, I mean, that is really where everything stems from, from the room. And also, uh, we have a, a big vis effects budget to our show, but we also try to bring action to the show, and action is expensive I mean, with all the choreography and the stunt actors and whatnot. So it's, it's you know, we tried to make it work as best we could, and hopefully mm -hmm. people will be satisfied with what we bring. Um, I just think, like, a, just a little bit more scratch would would help because if we just really want to throw it all up on the screen it's not like yeah i mean i drive a jetta but i mean but you know but it i mean you know it sounds like it would be self-serving but at the same time too i mean there is an element to be said for that if you were in this previous panel two weeks to break a story can you imagine if you had two weeks to bulletproof oh before you went to script i wrote episode 13 in four days i know that would just be heaven right and, and, you know, it's really one of those things where in prep and everything, like, you know, uh, we were oriented towards, well, prep starts when the crew starts. It's like, well, no, there's a group of people that start months before that. Mm -hmm. And the further back they start, the better your product is going to be. And it's the blueprint for everything. And it's like, there are times in Canadian rooms where it's like, you know, I, I'm a very social person. But when I'm in a room, there are times when, like, literally, I need to go home and just sort of, I, I call it uh, Glenn Close, you know, Fatal Attraction, which is just sitting there turning the light on and off and on and off because you're just trying to process everything. And money would buy you more of that. It, and yeah, it's time not would be good. As long as the time isn't used to, um, you know, there's this thing in, in comedy where it's like the joke isn't funny because you've read it yes. 15 yeah. times. But it was funny the first time you read it. So yeah. as long as the time isn't used to sort of crack things open for the sake of cracking yeah. open just because you have time. For sure. If it's if it's good, then let's just keep moving on to the to the next one. Anyway. John? Money time. You? Besides yeah. money. <laughs> Besides money. Yeah. Well time, first of all, I mean always it's it's just more time. Um, you know, there's a and and it's kind of sort of the timing of the money too. It's the way this the the, yeah. the whole thing is structured is you only can start writing so long before, yeah. and it would be great to start writing six months before that. Yeah. The disadvantage, of course, being that things happen. You know, you, you get everything perfectly laid out, and then an actor gets a job on a different series, and all of a sudden, you have to rewrite everything anyway. Um, uh, you know, I mean, if I were waving my magic wand, it would be, you know, the frustrating thing about working with Ian is his process is really different from mine. He sees different things. I've told yeah. him this. It's like. That frustrates me. I want to get. I want to see everything. I want to see what you th see too. I don't want to need you to see things, and uh, so that's uh, you know the, when I when I was thinking about why, or I was talking to somebody about why it was so great to be on this show. The first thing I named was I'm learning. Yeah, like I'm getting better because I'm working with Ian Weir. Yeah, and uh, and uh, you know that's the the best thing for me is just that I feel like I'm becoming a better writer. Yeah. And uh, Arctic Air is also an, an enormously complex show, yeah. more complex than the dinosaurs in, in Primeval. Um, so I'm learning on that level too. It's like there's so many solutions to so many different things. Uh, and it's great to walk, to walk into writing a story knowing I can write something that looks enormous because I know how to break it down into its constituent pieces and actually make it happen. Yeah. So the production experience is super important too. Oh, it's I have one more oh, thing. Oh, good. Yes. And that is, and uh, you know, the, I know our tax credit system works to the benefit of shows mm -hmm. in a, in a lot of ways, and then in a lot of ways it handcuffs shows because you can build your cast and crew based on what province you're pulling money from. Yeah. And you know, this the states they don't have that. It's not like they would go, well, this is, you know, a California room, so you're from New Mexico, so sorry. Yeah. You know? So it's in that way it's. You, when you're building your room, um, you're building it the best you, 
best people you can get from those where you're pulling your tax credit from and your right. and your cast as well and your directors and so sometimes it's a little like robbing this category for this category sure and does that make sense yeah it's an interesting place that you you come to there in the end john because um i, I didn't even realize until just now when you said that you're learning in arctic air that that makes me perk up i, I feel like i'm i'm incredibly learning on the show i am right now and when i when i look at it the show's it brings to a strange place to talk about show running, where is to end in a place of humility, because I think that the shows where I feel like, oh God, boy, I'm really learning stuff all the time. I, I don't really know. Those are the shows that are the ones that are, are so special. The ones where you're the one going, where you're the one going, I, you know, I'm, I need to tell these people a lot of stuff. Those aren't fun. They're not as fun as the ones where you are constantly being blown away by seeing different people and the different modes in which they work. Anyway, why don't we um, open it up to questions. We have one uh, at the back there, a uh, very early early person. Yes, you. Uh, why, why don't we uh, start with you? Hi, John. Hi, Dagan. It's Mackenzie Gray. Oh, hey. Hey, oh, hi. I saw yourself up there. Uh, I've worked for both of these uh, producers, and uh, they're amazing, I have to say. They run a really wonderful, warm uh, show. Both of them have worked for John many times, and Dagan, I just did Bitten. Um, I had a question that has perplexed me for about 15 years. I was on a series many years ago called The Net. It was created by um, uh, one set of producers, and they had a falling out about what the network wanted, and the, the key producer who created the show left. So they brought in a new showrunner uh -huh. who decided that there was a franchise flaw in the show and all these terminologies that he came in with, and completely sort of changed the show so that what was left was essentially the four of us leads in a kind of new paradigm. And I'm just wondering, it's, uh, it's, and, and the show I don't think, I think it could have had legs, but it, it didn't make it past the first season. So I'm curious about when you're asked to change a show, or if you've ever had to rescue a show, and what, what that challenge is. Um, have you ever had to change, like the network says, we're going a totally different way, change it all up. Or have you ever had, been asked to come on and rescue a show? Good question. That would be to you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, the <coughs> the show. I'm just thinking about how delicate to be. Uh, the 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 show called The Best Years was in Toronto, and they had um, the the concept of it was it was going to be like four years of being in university, and uh, and they had hired a Degrassi writer the first year, and so it became. Degrassi, only a couple of years older, it became it was very um, heavy and dramatic, and it was like I don't really remember people with guns and falling off of roofs when I was at university, you know, and it was it was really really heavy, and they brought the second year they brought in another Degrassi writer because that the Degrassi writer had left, and um, and they developed a bunch of material that was very very similar, and and there's a market for that. Degrassi has obviously been on for you know 700 years, so it, it's it's all good, but that isn't what the networks wanted. And they had, we had two different networks. We had the N in America who was servicing 13-year-old girls. And we had Global here who wanted women 18 to 49. So it was like, OK, you have six weeks to camera. Here's the material. None of it is usable. What do you want to do? And they were in the middle of casting new characters. Like literally, I was looking at the editions. I was calling them saying, just don't do the callbacks yet. Just let me write some sides, please. The character's going to change. And uh, so for me, that was the puzzle. It was like, how do I satisfy these two networks that are looking for something completely different? And the only solution I could think of was, OK, well, the original concept of this show is you know, women have got to look back and say, damn, I don't remember that we were that witty, but they were the best years of my life. Mm -hmm. And girls were going to look ahead and say, damn, i got to go to university. <laughs> right? And so that's the show we wrote. And so it became sort of a romantic comedy more uh, than that. Hmm. And it still got canceled. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's a great. It's a great thing about being a showrunner. I think the most important thing is, you will be fired. So the only question is, will you leave with your soul or without your soul? <laughs> oh, that's, that's great advice. That's the only question. Yeah. Uh, it's also how far into the ditch are you? You know, I think. I think there's another good example. If you look at another example, a show like Murdoch, was not in trouble, but I think that if you look at that show and you look at it now, what Peter Mitchell do, is doing with it. It's the best version of itself, mm -hmm. and uh, and the the ratings prove it. 
So they're the ones you can rescue and the ones you can't. They, you know, you call, you call those triage jobs, I think, right? Yeah. It's just, they just got to get through it. <laughs> Yeah, and some things, sometimes it's just so far behind the eight ball it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. we did eight episodes, and it was wonderful. It was a lovely show, but yeah. it was I, just too I said behind. this in the continuum room, too. It, it is on, uh, it is if you're a writer, and if you want an instructive uh, uh, point of view, and I think it was filmed here, there's a box set of the new, of the Bionic Woman reboot from a couple of years ago, and there's only seven episodes. And it's, it's fascinating to watch because it's seven different shows. And, like, it just, it, it's crazy. Like, they're flailing. You can see them flailing, and it's, it's really instructive. You learn more from disasters than you do from, uh, from excellent stuff. A question there, yes. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, where can you get that doc on the show running that was put together by the government? Is that available to the public? It should be if you just Google HRDC, um, Human I Resources Development Canada, and show running okay, or thanks, showrunners. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is on a website somewhere, sir. And if, and if, and if you can't get it from them, if you call the Writers Guild of Canada, I'm sure that they can uh, provide you with it. Okay, great. Second question. Do you guys put together pitch Bibles? And if you do, what do you put in them? Ooh, good question. Uh, I had a Bible for Bitten because it was adaptation um, so in the mythology and, and a lot of characters had come from the book, but we also deviated in some ways. So it was quite an extensive Bible, actually, because it had episode summaries, like one-page summaries. It had characters, it had, you know, it's what Stonehaven, the, the sort of, I don't want to use the word gothic, but the, the house, this is what this is set is going to look like versus the Toronto world, and um, a section on tone, and a section about the, the mythology of these werewolves, like how they, you know, they're not influenced by the lunar cycle or um, it's a gene that's carried on the Y chromosome, and so women aren't werewolves, and except for our one character who was bitten in. And so it was sort of about like all these different factions of the show. So that it was for um, you know it was a, it had been ordered by the network, and uh, then so when E1 came onto the show, they had that. They used that as a sales tool. We used it when new writers would come on the show to familiarize themselves with how the book is different from the show. Do you do put pitch Bibles? Do the collector have a pitch Bible? Uh, it did. Uh, it took a year between, I think I wrote the script first. The collector started with having lunch with Larry Sugar. Right. And I'd been working on it for a while, and I had all this stuff, and, and, and we were leaving lunch, and he said, you got anything? I'm going to Europe. <laughs> I said, a uh, guy who sells souls, sells souls for the devil. I love it. And he left for three months, and he came back three That's months so later, late. and he said, okay, I sold it to everybody, but I guess I should tell you what I told him the show was, because it may not correspond to what you said. <laughs> and that was the same. It had, a, it had a mythology to it that was, you know, be, it, I mean, it's a guidebook for, for writers as well, right? But, but it was also, the Bible's also an early chance, in my mind, to write something in the style of the show. Yeah. yeah. So if it's a funny show, the Bible is funny. If it's a dark, serious, twisted show, the, the Bible is That is such thriller. a good note. There's yeah. so many documents you read that are not like that that it reads like you know, a medical uh, thing. Um, I think Bibles used to be a lot rarer in the States. They were always common here. A few years ago, they got, did you ever work on anything with the, CBC had, went, through a, went through a phase where they wanted like 75 page Bibles. Oh God, no. That, oh my God, it was a dark time. And it was, uh, and, and, and that, what that's coming from is the impulse to, you know, it's something that we don't understand and if you quantify it, we'll feel better hmm. about it. And uh, you know, they're a limited utility, but yeah, it's an ongoing thing. We all have to do them, and and everyone is different. And one, I've seen ones that work, that are funny and that are great and that are totally breezy, and ones that are completely programmatic and they work too. It's like it's alchemy, man. Uh, another question? Yes. Well, if you could uh, maybe say some of the things you like uh, about uh, creating slash developing something new over coming on board with something that's already in progress, and vice versa, something like. About uh, coming on board with something in progress over creating and developing something new. Well, I wish somebody would just hand me the Da Vinci Code or something to turn into a show. That yeah. would be easy. Yeah. Um, I don't, I've done both. Um, you know, to create something of your own. Uh, you know, I'm right, right now. I'm on Ian's show, for instance, and I'm looking at Ian, and 
And even he forgets. Sometimes I'll remind him and I'll say, look at this stuff. Look at these characters interacting with each other. You created this out of your own mind. You made these people up. Michelle is over there saying, yeah, but I made them. <laughs> 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 this, is our develop this is our development exec here, right? And there is something really, truly beautiful about that, where it's like stuff you made up. Because for me, in the third season, we're doing a bunch of digital media content. We're doing a bunch of like scenes. And so it's a chance to do completely out of context things. Let's put these two characters together and see what they do. Right? And they talk. And when you created those characters yourself, it's like, wow, I, you're God, right? I've created these people and have these interactions. Um, uh, you know, whereas the, the beauty of, of adapting something is that there's a depth there, ideally, in a book that an author has probably spent a year or two creating this world, right? And so you enter into this universe and you have all that shorthand already. And, it, and so, but, but <coughs> as Megan has discovered, sometimes you have to veer away from it anyway just to make it all work for TV. Yeah, because there were decisions in the book that we uh, chose to decide differently, and um, characters that well, we brought some new characters into the universe, and and um, so in the in this way, I was a little kind of a little bit of both because it was you know we're working from an adaptation or we're working adapting material, but then we're also blowing the world out. In a way, and, and um, because the book itself is quite, it just follows one character's POV, and it's a lot of in, internal monologue. So, in adapting that, we uh, or I had to sort of take it, create story arcs for all these other characters, because there are about eight main characters that needed their own arcs. So, there are different challenges, I guess, is the answer. We have, uh, we got a few. Can we take them both? We could sure. Way at the back, uh, and then let's take this gentleman here in the. Uh, oh, that's Tom. That's Tom. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Thanks. Um, I'm not hearing a model that I wanted to ask you about, so I'm going to ask you about it. Um, what if you have a writer creator who has put together a, an annotated script and all of the Bible, and yet is not an appropriate person to be a showrunner? Um, because of a lack of experience on a television set or whatever. Um, how do you work with that kind of a model? And thinking at the same time that you're going to have, you know, executive producers, producer directors, crew, uh, showrunner producers, story editors, blah, you know, where does the buck stop? I think it really depends on the agreement between the... Um producer, because I think you would bring that into a producer, and the producer would marry you to a showrunner. Um, and I think that's really the agreement that you have with the producer about how much creative control and what, what your role would be in that, and whether you would work hand in hand with the showrunner. Um, you know, I think in the case of something like Seed, there is a good collaboration between the creator of that show and the showrunner of that show. And uh, I think, you know, there are instances of, of this in Canada, for sure. John? Uh, well, my, and my reference is probably more the American system, where it's, you know, the <clears throat> if you happen to have created something that, that somebody sees a seed in, I mean, uh, uh, Lost is an example, was a guy they brought in, some, you know, Lindelof and all those people to take an idea. Um, you know, you're there, it's probably going to be changed a lot. That's the likelihood of the reality of it, and, and uh, you'll be on staff, and you'll be working for the person who is running your show, what you think of as your show. And uh, the tough part is you just have to swallow it and be glad that you're in this position. I mean, that's the truth of it. It's, it's painful yeah. and, uh, and uh, often, I think, humiliating for people because they think, oh, I created this concept, and so therefore I should be running this, and they don't even know what they don't know. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the big, uh, the, the instant reaction I had to your question was, how annotated? <laughs> because I think that's, that speaks to a lot. It, it's a difficult thing. We, in this country, buy concepts from people that haven't done things before. That doesn't really happen, happen in the States very much. And uh, it really is about what is your attitude going into it, you know? Like, I mean, a lot of those marriages don't work because either, because, because again, it's exactly the opposite of what we've been talking about here today. Um, you know, about uh, fits that work because the communication is good, because the people are trying to make the same show, because people are, are on the same page. 
in the U.S. often when, they, when, when there's somebody that won't let the show, they pair them with somebody and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Here, it doesn't work out a lot more, I find. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact of, of uh, unrealistic expectations going in. Um, part of what you buy when you buy a series from somebody is not just the concept or the idea. It's the ability to execute the idea. I mean, right here today, right? John pitched on Bitten, uh, and they didn't like his approach. Dagan had a better approach. There will be times, I'm sure, where you're, where you're up for the same thing, where I'm up for something that you're up for, and it goes to somebody else because of what you're, they're buying your take and your ability to execute that take as well. It's a great question, though. Yes, Tom. Um, great panel. I have a, a question for all of you. Um, I hear the concern you have about more money, more room, um, you know, <laughs> forget Sorry. tax credits. And I don't, you know, we all completely agree with that. But practically speaking, as showrunners, one of the things I'd like to know is, would it make sense to you to have fewer directors each season? You know, you've worked on shows where 13 episodes, you might have someone directing one in 13 or but you could ostensibly have 10 or 11 directors coming in. Mm -hmm. would, would it make better sense to you, and how would it help you if you had fewer directors each season? I mean, I know the Directors Guild's, Guild's not going to like this question, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that would help you with your process, because so often a director is taking what you're doing as a shorthand, and I just wanted to know what you think about possibly doing that more than we do now. Definitely. I, my ideal would be to have three directors one who's in prep, one who's on the floor, one who's in post. And, uh, you know, in a first season, you are sort of sampling who has the right sensibility for the show. But I think once you get into second season, um, and there are certain director friends of mine that I've talked to about this, it's, and that's, I think that they kind of like, if they're one of those three, um, of course, um, like that idea as well, because then it's, there's a, um, it's just sort of, I guess streamlining things and, and the, the inner speak is known already. John? Yeah, well, it's a tough question for directors to hear, right? Because <clears throat> suddenly there's only, you know, even fewer directors working than there are now. But, um, uh, you know, uh, Arctic Air is block shot already, two episodes per block, two episodes per block. So we have fewer directors to begin with. And, um, you know, in a show, as shows become more complicated and as, as they become more, if they, if they are technically, technically complicated, uh, or if there is a trick to making them because of the budget, you know, which is always $100,000 less than it should be, no matter what the level of the budget is. Um, I think there's, Gary and I have talked about finding, and it's kind of a message to directors, finding director producers and having them cycle through so that you may not need a director producer that's overall but if you have a, you know, a Gary Harvey and a, and a Pat Williams and a, and a Martin Wood, for instance, who are all experienced director producers, then they all sort of become these self-contained units um, that can handle anything on set and know <coughs> how to make their days no matter what and, have, and still have to be great and have all those things. And, <coughs> and uh, on a partnership level, that would be a real blessing. And then, of course, over, over time, you know, I think creatively it is, it is great. And, you still need some fresh blood, just like you need, I think, fresh writers yeah. sometimes. But, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it can be. It has its advantages, for sure. Mm -hmm. I think fresh, I mean, there's that psychology of the crew thing, too, right? When you get a new, dire the, a new director that's a shiny new toy that comes in when people are tired in the 10 spot, yeah. sometimes can really reinvigorate the whole process. So it's an up and down sort of thing. But I think that's kind of a reflection, Tom, too, of, of in a weird way, of why we went to show running, right? Television used to be a lot less complicated. Everything, when everything resets to zero at every week and the stories were less complex and you didn't have to track plots and stuff like that, you know, you could hire freelance writers. You didn't need a room. You didn't need a showrunner as much. This is maybe the other side of that coin, you know? Um, but it's, it's certainly, a, it's, it's, it actually makes me lump up a little bit because, yeah, you, you certainly don't want to put directors out of work, but, mm. you know, there's an element to it that, that that's true. Do we have one last question that we wants to, uh, to have the last word? Great. Oh, we're going to thunder Wait. down. We have two uh, questions. Well, two, oh, we'll, we'll take one more. But we'll ask I'll, them simultaneously. I'll do my hand dance <laughs> until you get your mic. Are we getting him a mic? See? Jazz hands. Yeah, I'm not. 
I require amplification anytime I speak. But uh, I just wondered, I was curious about the two of you, what you think, it's a, it's a kind of a personal question about, uh, for you two, what are the strengths that you bring as artists, as creatives, uh, to, to the particular shows that you do? Great question. Gosh, I, I like the order here because you're always on the spot first. I feel Somehow. so Canadian about that answer. Um, my, uh, strengths, I guess just um, uh, optimism and perseverance. How's that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you were like, uh, this is my interview. Um, about the creative process. Uh, Uh, yes, I, I love being on set. I love being in the room. I uh, particularly like wardrobe, um, and a lot of the other executive producers don't, so I'm always in those <laughs> meetings. It's weird the way that we sort of divvy things up, and I have not taken one picture car meeting ever in my life. Right. I will g g say, I think she should be driving a Bronco, and I think he should have something classic and big gas guzzling thing. But, uh, you know, what, I could not give a shit what they drive, honestly. But what they wear, very, very, very important. <laughs> and the hair and makeup, very, very important. So there are this, you know, certain things where uh, I'll be in those meetings and other EPs won't, and then picture cards. Does that? <coughs> hair, makeup, and wardrobe, that's great advice. <laughs> things to pay attention to. What are we looking at? Hey, are we looking at the background, or are we looking at the pretty people that are in front of the thing? That's what we're looking at. Um, uh, you know, my probably, probably my greatest advantage is that I live completely inside of a fictional world inside of my head. You know, when I get into a world, I just disappear into it. It was, uh, you know, when So Weird, we were So, so Weird, we, we were on two seasons of So Weird, and then we were fired, and it went for a third season, and I was absolutely miserable for like six months, yeah. because those were my people. Like, I was immersed in that world, and, and uh, Collector was canceled after 40 episodes, and it was much easier the second time. Because right. it was like I had an 80-episode plan, and I really I knew where it was all going, and so on. But I kept a little bit of emotional distance. But you know, I, I, that's what I keep reminding everybody is like, we're here for these punishing hours, and we're spending all this money and stuff. You got to be super excited. Like we're storytellers. We get to tell stories, and everything that we do—the wardrobe and the hair and the makeup and the cars and everything—is about telling the story. And uh, and then they screwed up on set, and then you get to go to editing and fix it all over again, <laughs> right? Yeah. And. Uh, um, so that's, uh, you know, that's the major thing is that I just still, the same as when I was seven years old, I still get lost in stories. Great. And did we have that last question? Did is that Richard up there? Oh, uh, hi. Uh, um, my question is about Bitten. Obviously, I haven't seen the show and I haven't read the book. My question is, did you feel um, a little worried about taking on such a genre piece, like, um, and finding a fresh and sophisticated way to make it? Like that would, for me, that would seem to be really challenging because, like, I've seen shirtless werewolves and I've seen, you Not know, like this, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Are they buffer than Taylor Lautner? Apparently yeah. so. Oh. So I've seen shirtless werewolves. I've seen the pilot for Teen Wolf. I just feel like this is all kind of like re a retread. So, how do you go to work and make everything fresh and sophisticated? Um. Well, maybe because I haven't actually seen Twilight or Teen Wolf. So I've seen clips of Twilight. Um, I, and I saw the birthing scene, which was, um, yeah, I had the flu and I couldn't get off the couch. <laughs> so it was what was on. Um, I think where we differ, first of all, we have a female protagonist who's a werewolf, uh, which sets us apart from other werewolf shows. But I think we also, we, we're aware of the other ones. You know, we watched True Blood, I watched True Blood, and um, Being Human, which I really like and respect. And so tonally, we're different. Uh, we are more of a mafia show than these other things. Uh, we're still a romantic show. We still deal with universal things like love and family and betrayal and loyalty, but um, tonally we're an adult uh, drama. 
know yeah. if that answers that question. And she's the only female werewolf. She's that's the only what's female different about werewolf. It, right? yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's a great question. Listen, uh, thank you very much for coming back and for being around and for sharing this generous afternoon with these two fabulous people. Dagan Frickland, uh, the uh, co-showrunner of Bitten, coming to the Space Channel early next year. And of course, John Cooksey, uh, creator of The Collector and the executive producer of Arctic Air, which premieres in January, right? Yeah. yeah. See, I know when to plug. Thank you very much for coming, guys. Bye. Hey.